Hey there, comrades. You're watching The Red Lettuce. I am your host, Eric Unger, and I'm joined by my co-host, Mitch Friedman. Tonight, we are honored to have Gloria Lariva. She's a revolutionary socialist running as a third party candidate for president, representing the Party for Socialism and Liberation. Gloria is a labor, community, and anti-war activist based in San Francisco, California. Gloria, welcome to The Red Lettuce, and thank you for joining us. First, let's talk about your 10-point platform, what the Party for Socialism and Liberation represents, and tell us about your vice presidential candidate, Leonard Peltier. Yes, thank you. Um, first, I'd like to start by saying Leonard Peltier is a political prisoner, Native American in the United States who really terribly has served 44 years now. He's still behind bars right now in Coleman Prison, Florida. He is a victim of US FBI persecution and he's, he's really was targeted in the 1970s for having been an activist in the American Indian movement who like the Black Panther Party was targeted by the FBI and the US government in the COINTELPRO war on these revolutionary organizations that were trying to change society in the United States when there was a huge upheaval, uh, starting with the Black Liberation Movement, civil rights, uh, and it engendered all the kinds of struggles like women's, uh, Chicano, Puerto Rican, Native American. And so Leonard Peltier has a long story without going into it. You can read in our website, Lariva Peltier. My name is L-A-R-I-V-A and Peltier is P-E-L-T-I-E-R 2020.org. That's our campaign website. And you can read his story about why he was falsely convicted and why we are fighting for his freedom along with many people around the world. So our 10 point program is one in which we summarize our view of how we see society, both with immediate reforms, immediate demands, but also how we see society under socialism. Because if we can see in the crisis right now of the pandemic, that all the ugly, horrific, exploitative nature has been exposed of what capitalism is really about where the massive productive capacity of the United States is lying idle rather than producing all the PPE, the ventilators, all the equipment, producing the medicines that could be used now to help alleviate the suffering of people who have turned positive or the tests. Everybody in this country should be tested, the masks, everything. But capitalism is uh, the reason why we can't have that. Because if you can't make a major profit from it, profiteering, profit gouging, then the capitalists don't want to produce. And then we see also the rescue, uh, the economic so-called rescue package, which is really rescuing the banks and the major corporations while we're waiting for the crumbs to pass down to us. So our program says, number one, make the essentials of life, housing, jobs, healthcare, education, free including the other things that people need, clean water and so on. And then that capitalism must end in order for the earth to survive. It is capitalism that's calling, causing climate catastrophe and racism, police brutality, mass incarceration, pay re reparations to the African-American and native community, full rights for all immigrants, including the undocumented, shut down all the military bases that are worldwide, over 800 bases in the world, bring the troops home, create real jobs for them instead of fighting and dying, killing people abroad. Uh, honor the native treaties is number six and free Leonard Peltier, of course. Number seven is full equality for LGBTQ people. Um, no to all these so-called religious exemption laws that allow discrimination against LGBTQ people. Number eight is stop the war on women, equality for women, free, legal, safe abortion on demand. Nine is expand and um, defend our unions. And we need this more than ever now that today the labor secretary 
is asking for the so-called guest workers, the undocumented who are allowed in for a period to do the harvesting in the fields. He's wanting to have their wages cut, which are already poverty wages, in order to help big business, agribusiness. It's outrageous. They're talking about no funding to keep the post office going. That's 600,000 workers. And all the Walmart, the delivery workers, the gig workers, they need to be recognized as workers and have the right to a union. And number 10, ultimately, take over the stolen wealth that's been taken by the banks, the corporations, and jail the Wall Street criminals. That's it in a nutshell. It's a little bit of a long answer, but... It's perfect. Go. No, yeah. This... I love all of those ideas. <laughs> yes. Um... And we, we also should mention that there's a documentary out there that I highly recommend everyone go see about uh, Leonard Peltier. It's called The Incident at Ogala. And it's a documentary that tells his story to learn more. Yes, it's very important to watch because um, there's so much involved in his case. Yes. Um, so, Mitchell, do you want to take so, notes? Yeah, yeah. So to kind of segue, um, pick off pick up where you were saying about ending capitalism. Um, some people say the only way to win a presidential campaign or election is to uh, run in the Democratic or Republican Party. What are your thoughts on that? The, I think the only, the only ones who reach the level of nominee for the Democrat or Republican, like now Biden being the nominee, Trump presumably the nominee for the Republicans, the only way to get to that level is to be vetted, to be cleared by the power structure, by the ruling class, the banks, the corporations, the Pentagon, the intelligence agencies, and show that you are willing to do whatever imperialism demands of you. Because ultimately the president in the United States is the executive of the ruling class. Uh, to manage the affairs of the capitalists. And so that's why you saw someone like Barack Obama, who so many millions of people were excited about. A man whose image was different, being African American was a historic thing, and the fact that he became president, it was, you know, how many white men had been president before him. And yet, he did carry out the demands of the imperialists. Actually, when you look at this program, it was very um, vague. It was like real change. Real, I forget the slogan, but it was about real change and hope. And you see that he oversaw the overthrow of the Honduran government, a president who was not a radical, but was looking toward alliance with Cuba, Venezuela, and the ALBA alliance. It was the sharing of resources by the Latin American countries, which is an act of defiance of the US. He oversaw the bombing and destruction of the government of Libya, which was a country that was not in the orbit of the U.S., that was using its vast oil resources and water resources to provide for the people and was calling for unity of African peoples for economic independence and sovereignty. We saw many destructive things during Obama, Obama's term, and he had already indicated early in his campaign, which is why he kind of sailed through to the presidency, I will do what's needed to defend the system. So someone like Bernie Sanders, who was challenging the system, um, he's a 30 year senator, he, you know, he had done some progressive liberal things. We have, con we have a difference of opinion with him on international questions. But still, his call for national health care, of free education in, in public higher education, housing, and it was becoming more, you know, much more progressive, saying a massive reform of uh, the prison system, women's LGBTQ rights, all these things that no other candidate would really express. That's dangerous. Because what the, what the capitalists want is more wealth, more profits, more war. Because if you look at it, the capitalists never have enough. 
They got a big tax cut from Trump, for example, in 2017 that was passed. And immediately, you can read the news in the New York Times, immediately after it was signed by Trump, the lobbyists who fill the halls of Congress, they're the real powers for the corporations. They walked in and revised the law even more to where the 25% tax ceiling for the super rich and the corporations, it effectively, in 2019, the taxes were 11% was what the corporations paid average. So I think Sand, uh, Sanders was really too dangerous for them. And here they are willing to have a man who's highly at risk of de defeating Trump, Biden, who is a warmonger. He has all this reactionary history. And even then, he can't even express himself. They're willing to have someone like him rather than someone who will challenge their power structure by uh, Sanders, meaning Trump could very well win. Trump, Biden. Uh, we know it's almost how, like they would rather have uh, Donald Trump as president than Bernie Sanders. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Right. That's what uh, it boils down to. Yeah. So it, you're asking me, so back to the question about um, is there any possibility of really challenging the Democrats and Republicans or what's the point of running? The point of running a third party progressive candidates like ourselves or you know, even the Greens are, are, are challenging it across the country um, and other socialists in the past is to reach the population, the people in the one arena where everyone is focused and where everyone is raising this country to be told the only political role you can play is to vote. Every two years, every four years. And then after that, leave it up to us. You can vote for change through what you thought would happen with Obama, but we will decide to have war, cutbacks, and more deportation. And what we're saying in the campaign is, mm -mm, it's gonna take a fight, that the workers have the power, that the people have the power, that the only way change has ever come about is when people organize. Even recently on the fight for 15, I say to people, which politician, do you know which politician first took up the issue or first raised a demand for, for $15 an hour minimum wage? It was the workers who did it. Right. They started it. And the politicians only got involved to, to, to slow down the $15 an hour mm -hmm. from immediate to some states made it three, four, five years from now, you'll get 15 bucks. And by then it's too little. So since it is an, an imperative to organize outside the Democratic Party, um, how can we build a unified coalition with other leftist movements now? And what are the mechanisms? What, what are the mechanisms needed in order to make that happen? Well, in different times, when there's a threat of war, many organizations, peace veterans for peace, for example, Code Pink, the Answer Coalition, the PSL and other socialist groups, sometimes unions, community organizations, will all get together for organizing ad hoc coalitions against the threat of war or other, other issues. We need to have coalition, we need to have unity. Um, that's what we do. I think right now, the movement is developing and we're seeing an upsurge of people who've never done political activism before. It, beyond the traditional things that we understand of already established organizations. Right now you see Walmart, McDonald's, fast food workers, Amazon workers taking action because people will always always fight back. People will always resist injustice. It's happened throughout the history of class society. But especially now, when, when people see the danger of the virus, of possibly dying and knowing 
how serious it can get. And you can be denied the, the ventilator, anything that you might need to hopefully survive. And people are like, I'm not doing this job. Someone, you know, um, there's been work sites now where someone turns up positive. Nobody was given masks or anything. And people have walked out. We're not going back to work till you give us what we need. But sadly, we need much more action. Sorry for the street noise. Okay. Sadly, we need much more action right now. Because what the ruling class intends in this crisis is to find a way with the shutdown of industry, of many jobs being lost right now, they don't intend for those jobs to come back. For teachers, for example, uh, I have a sister in LA, a sister in New York, we have many members of our party who are teachers, who are being told, expect major cutbacks. We're gonna have to renegotiate our con your contract. Uh, layoffs, wage cuts. We're not gonna give you what we had negotiated about lesser class sizes. Even community teachers, community college teachers are being told, robots might replace you on online education. And in the post office, which is 600,000 workers, one of the most important jobs in this country, one of the most respected government jobs, in the, in the rescue package of early April, now it turns out things that are being revealed in the negotiations that Trump said, I'm not signing this package if there's any money for the postal workers and the, and the postal service. He wants to see it collapse. It's a union job. And those workers have a lot of power. Mm -hmm. So what ended up for the postal workers at best was not a grant like they're giving to the banks, but a $10 billion loan, which is nothing. These workers are at great risk of losing their job. Uh, Amazon, Amazon is going to get more power with the hundreds of thousands of businesses, small, I'm talking small business, little shops, all these little places, little pharmacies, uh, you know, restaurants. They stand a great chance of shutting down permanently. And then the big corporations like Amazon, Walmart, you know, the big businesses will be even bigger than ever. Yeah, I, yeah. Saw, I saw on TV the other day, the CEO of Coca-Cola. I'm like, what essential production is that? Yeah. Not at all, okay. But anyway, Coca-Cola CEO said, this is, you know, we're going to overcome this. He said, we've gone through crises before, 9-11, blah, blah, blah. He said, and each time we've come out, bigger and stronger. Yeah, because you gobble up the little companies. That's right, what that's happen. what monopolists do. And this is what this bill does. It furthers monopolization because that's, that, that's what the stage of, that's the stage of capitalism that we're in. We're in its final stage. It's, it's monopolist imperialist stage. Exactly. And either we come through this crisis with a higher level of organization and fight back where we push back the banks and the big landlords and demand, no, we're not going to go into debt for five, six months, however long it takes that we have no income or proper income to pay the rent or the mortgage. Either we come out with a higher level of struggle to not get evicted or foreclosed or we end up with millions more people in the street or indebted to the banks for the rest of our lives. Right. And the students, what was in the package for the students? Do y'all know? Nothing. Nothing. There's nothing. nothing. Absolutely nothing. nothing. Not a cancellation of the debt like the banks get. Uh, they said, okay, you don't have to pay your loan uh, until after September. Wow, thanks. And they canceled, didn't they cancel the interest on it too? They canceled the accumulation of interest. Right, 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 right. right. Interest until September. And of course, you all know, it's the only Thanks. debt you cannot, 
It's the only debt you can declare bankruptcy on. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's, Thanks to Joe Biden. <laughs> it's, it's really sick. Uh, so, it's a, this is a major so hopefully, point. hopefully workers will see in the places that are non-union the need for the union and, and, and coalesce together as they are right now in wildcat actions, in community action, to see that what we need is organization of the workers through the unions, and really to see that capitalism is destroying people. The myth of America the greatest, America the great, America the richest, America the best country in the world, America the democracy is like, uh, it's all a myth, sorry. And I think people are realizing that. Their loved ones dying, their loved ones getting sick, them with no job, with no income, Mm -hmm. panicking what to do. So we as a socialist party and the other movements, everybody who we, you know, we all know each other. We, we, we have a role to play to provide some guidance and solidarity. Right. How could we use, how would you use um, your perspective here to maybe reach to those, um, undecided people who don't want to vote for Joe Biden, but are afraid to, you know, withhold their vote for the Democratic Party. How could we get them to see outside of, of capitalism as, as the problem? Because I don't think they understand, a lot of people don't understand that capitalism is a problem. They're, they're thinking that, you know, the liberals are the left wing of, you know, of, of the system, but it's just, it's not true. So what, do you, what are your thoughts on that? You know, I really think, you know, in, 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 in seeing the TV and talking to people, um, I have ventured outside in this social isolation. But I've also, been, I've also been talking to people before the restrictions. I was on a campaign trail, a campaign trail, yeah, <laughs> from uh, January through mid-March when I had to come home. I've been to the South the Southeast, the West, the Midwest. I've been all over before I had to finally come home, including South Dakota. And people are saying, we can't go on like this. We can't continue. The average person. Um, however, I think there are millions of people who were supporting Sanders. Many of them, probably the majority of them are saying, Dem exit, hashtag dem exit. Mm -hmm. I'm not doing this anymore. I did this twice or I did this one. I gave it my owl. And this is what you did to us because they saw the process of the media crushing Sanders and the DNC crushing Sanders. And they know what it signifies that there's no change within the system. There are a lot of people who are contacting us and probably cont contacting other leftist groups who say many people were getting so many applications that I want to become a socialist. That's it. About the election, I say this. We're running in a number of states. We had many more states lined up for petitioning to get on the ballot, but the virus shut us down. We could not justifiably go in the street. It'd be crazy to go in the street and tell people, let me sh give you my clipboard. Uh, violating the necessity of being, you know, apart from each other, we couldn't continue petitioning. So some of those states we can't be on now, but we will be on in California, which is a major state. We won the primary and the, the, the delegate votes in the convention assure us that we will be on the ballot here. We will be on the ballot in New, very likely New Mexico, in Colorado, Louisiana, we got nominated by the Liberty Union Party in Vermont. Uh, and we, will, we are filing lawsuit in Florida to get on the ballot because we are a ballot access party, but they kicked us off illegally in 2016. Wow. And we've had a very good chance of winning the suit. Anyway, that's not 50 states, of course. Uh, as I said, the purpose of our campaign goes way beyond the election day. After election day, we'll be fighting in a way that other candidates are not fighting because I represent a party. 
and our party is a fighting party. I, I've told people, including a couple of my relatives who go, you know, I really can't vote for you. I got to vote to defeat Trump. I say, <laughs> I understand that. But you, you got to be aware more than anything that Biden is not the answer. So don't go to sleep after election day and go like, whew, you know, I mean, if Clinton, if Hillary Clinton had won, the same would have continued, not in the mm -hmm. same degree maybe as Trump, but I think that Syria would have been destroyed. If yeah. She wanted to, if she was intent on doing it. So I, I say to people, you know, what really counts is what you do afterwards. And what, you, what counts is what you do now. Yeah. It's beyond elections right now. We're entering, we're in the middle of a crisis for the working class. And by the working class, we mean the people at work, the people unemployed, the people have no other means to survive, except that if they're disabled or unemployed and, and, and get an income, the, peop the kids, the families, the students, we are all the working class because we don't own capital. Right, exactly. Um, I, to segue into one of our next questions here, um, uh, most people know that the fossil fuel companies and the military industrial complex are major contributors to cl the climate crisis, but the animal agriculture industry is directly linked to COVID-19 and to the destruction of the environment. Where do you stand on this issue and do you support a transition to a plant-based food production as an alternative? I think vegetarianism and even veganism to a certain extent. I think it's all very important. Uh, I, we think about this all the time and it's part of our program. And, you know, in, in detail, I think the issue of um, moving away from animal protein consumption is essential for reducing the climate catastrophe. I would not say that it has to be eliminated totally. I don't think it's realistic in the world. I mean, honestly. Yeah, I'm with you on that. Yeah, yeah there are too many people in the world. You know, you talk about people in Somalia who the, the fishers on the coast who, whose people depend on fish. You know, I mean, there's animal protein. But certainly the pumping and pumping and pumping of, for example, the f fast food companies, it, it, it's so gross. Yeah. To see these ads like, get your triple, it's, now it's like triple burger. Yeah. yeah. With bacon. <laughs> and to see what the hog industry has done to the Caribbean Sea mm. of killing the life and all the runoff and the spraying of the manure into the air because they have no way to get rid of it. It's, it's insane. The oil, but the oil industry as well, all of that, all of that. Well, how do we achieve this? Uh, socialism, we can't do it without taking over the means of production and changing what we produce, what we produce. In addition, you know, it's not just vegetarian, vegetarianism right now is not, the total answer either because the problem is a system and right now you have agribusiness that sprays third generation antibiotics onto crops and orchards to speed up the, the growth of those vegetables and fruits I don't know if you know that yeah and then we have an overproduction and then they yeah you know, they'll, they'll dump out the, the, the milk um, and they'll throw away all the food instead of distributing it to people. Um, and then they'll ask for a bailout for the loss that they've. Yeah, uh, and, 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 and the thing is, they're showing the milk being dumped now, but it was actually being dumped several months before this crisis. When Trump, or, when Trump ordered tariffs on Canadian cheese and milk producers, I heard a radio show, which told it all, where farmers in the U.S. said, you know, it's not really Canada that's the problem. They said, we've overproduced milk because of the almond milk industry, 
the alternative so-called milk industry. Mm -hmm. And I, and even there's a problem. And I tell a lot of young people who I know about almond milk. First of all, it's not very creamy. <laughs> no, it's really gross. <laughs> it, it really isn't. But years ago, the almond industry, which is based in California, all the almonds are produced here, basically, 95%. They have to keep growing and growing and expanding their production to so outdo each other. Yes. Yeah. So when you have you have the draining away of the water in the aquifers, the underground water lakes in the Central Valley, leaving hundreds of towns with no water. And it takes um, six gallons for an almond to grow. That's capitalism. Yeah. So this thing about, you know, be healthy, drink almond milk. I was like, no, if anything, drink pea milk or oatmeal milk, you know, but it has to be under the control of the working class, the people, right. the scientists, right. the environmentalist. Yeah, no, I definitely, I, I think the, uh, the means of production need to be controlled and operated uh, by and for the working class. Um, and you know, I, as a vegan, I, I have an issue with just the consumerist, uh, side of, of veganism, just thinking that we can just boycott these industries and that'll uh, be the end of slaughterhouses and animal oppression. But what I tried to explain to my other vegan comrades that don't really have an anti-capitalist practice is that if we don't overthrow capitalism, animals and their environment will still be exploited by the capitalist class because they will continue to pollute, de uh, uh, knock down their environment to, to further expand their, their buildings or what, whatever they're producing. Um, so animal liberation won't occur under capitalism. And that's only possible under socialism because animal liberation is tied to human liberation. Right. I think, I think we'll move on to our next question, which is, uh, we often hear demonization of socialist nations like Cuba, China, Venezuela, and the DPRK coming from both the Democratic and Republican parties and from the mainstream media. Tell us how your campaign fights against this and tell us what distinguishes your foreign policy from the two capitalist imperialist parties. Yeah, thank you for bringing up the issue of the socialist countries. If you recall, when Trump gave his State of the Union address, and he said, we will never have socialism. He said that last year. Oh, yeah. Year before. We will never have socialism in the U.S., and we're going to get rid of it in Cuba, Venezuela, and Nicaragua. And, you know, really terrible that these last months has seen an intensification of the blockade against all three countries and North Korea and Iran, which is not socialist, but it's not in the orbit of the US. So with Cuba and Venezuela, it's so atrocious to see the US media, like the liberal New York Times, which is one of the worst papers in its coverage of Venezuela. Uh, they have these horrifying examples and I don't you know they'll, they'll say the other day they had an article that said a pregnant woman had to go to five hospitals she was in labor and she went to five hospitals and was denied at each one you know I do not believe that and be, but let's say it were true first of all it's not true because I've been there many times in Venezuela and I've seen the hospitals and they may have shortages because of the blockade, but they will not turn anyone down. And they have such a high value of women. You know, every society does. Of a pregnant woman, don't tell me you went to five hospitals and you were denied. Um, what is the purpose of that article, though? The purpose of it is to justify war. A I mean, war that will kill that. millions of people. Yeah. Yeah. And what's the purpose of it right now? is to hide the fact that we're having the biggest health crisis in our country, in our history. And that pregnant women in this country, many poor women are denied health care, and that m m maternal mortality 
is growing in the United States and it's one of the highest in the world because poor black, Latina, native women and poor white women don't get the care that they need, prenatal care that they need. I mean, it makes me so mad what they do to show Venezuela, Cuba, North Korea, which is so demonized, it's you know hard for anyone to find out what's really going on. But the purpose is, is to make people think you do not want socialism. Look at these countries, what they're going through, and hide the fact that the U.S. is responsible for the blockade of medicine and food to Cuba, Venezuela, and has blockaded North Korea for years, trying to do the same to Nicaragua. And despite that, Cuba has developed a healthcare system that's the envy of the world. And it has doctors all over the world helping in the crisis. And 70 countries now are asking for their interferon medicine that's helping save lives of people who are suffering lung collapse and preventing the virus from taking over your lungs. Venezuela, by the way, has the highest testing on COVID per capita than any other Latin American country, even though they're being portrayed as a basket case. That President Maduro declared early on that people don't have to worry about rent, that the rent is suspended and basically canceled, no debt accumulation for six months, and businesses as well. Now they're having a big economic crisis because the U.S. has stolen all their oil wealth in the U.S. and is blocking all their gold and money in the banks, 14 imperialist banks. They're keeping them from releasing the funds to Venezuela. And instead they've given it to, partially to Guaido, that puppet. And they're also keeping the rest for themselves because ultimately they want to overthrow the government. And right now there's a great danger that the U.S. aggression could increase. Trump, last week, in the middle of um, the first week of April, uh, ordered the doubling of military troops and naval ships directed against Venezuela. And before that, in, in March, Elliot Abrams, that fascist who helped uh, lead the counter-revolutionary wars in Latin America, Central America. Elliot Abrams announced that Venezuela's coast is going to have to be sealed off. Why? Because it sends oil to Cuba. And Cuba sends, has doctors in exchange, oil and doctors helping each other. So they want to smash the idea of, of uh, socialism while they try to crush the working class in the United States idea of even having unions. But we will overcome. Cuba is gonna survive. Venezuela is in a fighting stance to survive as well. The Nicaraguan people support their government. And you can't, you can't, as the Latin Americans say, you can't cover the sun with your thumb. You can, you know, you can't cover the sun with your thumb. You can't hide the truth. And the truth is that people are getting tired of capitalism. And the reason Trump said we're not going to have it here, socialism, is because more people are interested in socialism than ever, than ever in the United States, especially among young people. And that's what we have to look forward to. Um, as we experience COVID-19, what solutions could you bring to the table for at-risk demographics like indigenous communities, undocumented citizens, the houseless, and prisoners? Well, we, we have a campaign, and there's many other groups as well. We have a petition in various areas, uh, especially California. We have a, a petition here of, the, of our, my, my electoral campaign and the, and the Party for Socialism and Liberation, where we're calling on Governor, News, Governor Newsom to cancel the rents for as long as the pandemic lasts no accumulation of debt, to order no shutoffs of utilities, water, electricity, gas, and even the internet, to expand internet for people. 
uh, no mortgage foreclosures on people, including for small landlords and, and small business. We also say in that petition that there should be a board, a state board, to register undocumented workers and informal workers. So many people who clean house and now have no income because people are saying, Don't, you can't clean my house now. All those kind of jobs that people scrape by to register people, you know, who'll be honest, you know, nobody wants to, nobody wants to subject themselves to that. People want to work, but to give them immediate benefits. Uh, that's one thing. Housing for all, house everybody. People in the street are in great danger. Uh, there's a homeless shelter in San Francisco. This weekend, they announced that 73 people in that shelter are positive, have the illness. It is so outrageous, and we know what's going on in the prisons. It could end up being a wildfire. There was in South Dakota a women's prison where there were a few people who turned up positive. This was like a couple of weeks ago. And several women walked out of the prison. They're like, justifiably said, we're not going to die in here. It was a minimum security, I think. And so they left. They got captured. They got put back in, probably with more of a longer sentence now, because they tried to save their life. The warden just quit. She left. She left them to their own devices. The prisons are now death houses. So we demand everything necessary to put people in a hotel and then give them a home. There's, there's 17 million more homes, and I think many more than that now, with all the construction of quality, empty housing that could put everyone in a home. Now, I, ask, I tell people, you know, just one example, and there's bigger ones even, Jared Kushner, Trump's son-in-law. You know, he owns homes minimally in Baltimore and Maryland mostly Baltimore. How many of those do you think he made? None. Not Zero. a single one. Exactly. Uh, he owns 9,000. He, he has control over 9,000 families' lives. And way before this crisis, he was taking hundreds to court on a regular basis to try to evict them for failure to pay rent, for any excuse he could find because he sees a bigger market in evicting, jacking up prices, fix it up a little, and then just, you know, your, whatever price you command. Every one of those places should be taken over. All those tenants should become the owners outright. Mm -hmm. um, no compensation. It, it's such a crime. Now, remember I said that if we don't come out at a higher level, of the tenants and, and homeowners with more rights and the ability to keep our homes after this crisis that will face greater ruin. That's what happened in 2008. In the 2008 um, rescue, $700 billion for the banks. A little bit of money, you know, extended unemployment, no extra, you know, not a higher unemployment payment, but some unemployment. But what happened with that money was that the banks got more powerful, they monopolized more, and they foreclosed on at least 5 million homes. They took workers' homes away from them, kept the property, even though they got bailed out for the crisis they caused. And who's paying for that bailout? We are. We are. By budget cuts, Capitalism is a criminal enterprise, top to bottom. And we're also appealing in our petition, for example, and in our demands, the, 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 the demands that the party has, the PSL, aside from the 10-point program, because it's been, you know, there's new developments, is we're saying no foreclosures or mortgage uh, payments either for small business. The petty bourgeoisie, the small owners, you know, 
there are millions of people who depend on that for their jobs or their income. This is very small scale. And if they end up closing permanently, like I said before, the monopolization, the super rich will get even richer. This crisis gives us an opportunity to, for the people to wake up, many, many who felt, you know, who had comfortable lives, people who maybe struggled, but they had a job and they budgeted and go, okay, I'm doing okay. And it'll get better someday. In addition to all those who were just poor and barely hanging on or those who are like falling into destitution, we have the basis for a huge unity among all of us. And I think people are very open to ideas. People are open to radical ideas and they're not radical they're the only thing that makes sense. Right. And hopefully we can take this moment to make people realize that capitalism is the parasite and the working class and the poor are its host. Exactly. Mitch, do you want to uh, ask the, uh, our last question we have for the Oh, moment? yes. Um, this will kind of uh, be a summarizing question. What does a socialist America look like? Beautiful. <laughs> really, I mean, all we know is struggle right now. All we know is uh, oppression. And it, and it just comes to us in waves. You know, when you see the media, the police killings, police brutality, the racism, everything we see, we don't have to go over it. But with a socialist, America, a socialist United States, because Latin America is America too. Mm -hmm. um, everybody employed, there will be a shortage of labor, even when all the troops come home, because I see every senior who maybe lives alone, or even with family, all the millions of seniors can have, uh, not have to worry about losing their home, not have to worry about pinching pennies to pay for Medicare because healthcare will be totally free, that there will be as many workers as we need for those who need help in cooking. You know, there's a lot of seniors who are lonely, who need community, community centers created for them. There are some already. My mother was, you know, really taken care of uh, in her last years in New Mexico my, by my sister where she lived, but also because my sister works and has kids. My, my mother had the benefit of um, social workers who took care of her. But a lot of people don't have that because there's no funding. Um, I see young people learning skills I, I see the millions of young people who aren't even counted as unemployed because they never had a job and never had opportunity, especially black youth. So many black youth who are so demonized, who you know, know that if they could go out in the street and get killed by a cop, but who have no chance to go to college right now, you can either go to college or you can get job training because we need so many jobs. Look at the infrastructure of all the water delivery in this country, the thousands and thousands of towns, they all need rebuilding. The highways, the roads, the bridges. I was in St. Louis recently where you have a big part of the city is boarded up. Perfectly good homes, brick homes, but are falling, you know, on the stage of falling apart because They've been boarded up because nobody can live in them, because nobody can pay it. Give youth apprenticeships at union wages to fix those homes up and then give them the home and build a community. Education for all, including you know, adult classes, free education, um, healthcare for all, preventive care, Mental, mental health, unlimited mental health. 
the prisoners, humanize the prisons like I saw happening in Venezuela, by the way. I visited four prisons in Venezuela. It was amazing what they've done, where guards inside the prison are not armed, where they have, con they, they have safe and respectful relations with the prisoners and vice versa. Humanize the prisons. You know, there are, there are two and a half million in prison, many for drug violations, nonviolent uh, offenses, uh, parole violations. A lot of people need to be released immediately. Yes. There are a lot of people also, you know, it kind of tires me when I hear people saying, oh, people with nonviolent offenses should be let out. No, not just them. There's a lot of people who have served their time for violent offenses, who are no longer a danger, or perhaps never were, they, but got um, into something for, for, for poverty, you know? Let them out too. Now, there are some people who are dangerous, you know? You can think of the worst cases, uh, serial killers, uh, serial rapists. No, I don't think that that's possible, but the point of prison should be only to keep the offense from being repeated by those who would repeat it. But they should be treated humanely. Confinement to prevent crime. And that's a minimal part of what we see in the prison. But humane treatment. No, you shouldn't be tortured. Yes, you should have rights. Including to rehabilitation. Right. I um, I think there are many, many, many people who are falsely convicted too. Oh, of course. Many, I think most people in jail right now are in jail because they, they can't afford bail. They haven't well, even been charged with a crime. They, they, uh, so yeah, so the, the yeah, 97% of them um, never had a trial. Exactly. Well, that's all the time we have for tonight. Uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, on the Red Light of Gloria. We hope to have you on again soon, and we look forward to supporting your campaign. Before we wrap up, please let our viewers know where they can learn more and support your campaign. Okay, www.liberationnews.org for the news coverage about the COVID virus and, and everything else. The campaign website is larivapaltier2020.org. Thank you so much. We'll be on the ballot on write-ins as well in other states, but we'll be on the ballot in several states. And thank you. Thank you so much, Eric and Mitch.